Well, thank you for all, all of you for coming here in the rain today. Um, this is the Historical Museum's final Senior Wednesday program for the year. We take uh, November and December off for various reasons, but there are about 10 organizations, as you may know, in the Senior Wednesday circuit. They're all here in town. Every Wednesday in the morning, every Wednesday in the afternoon, there's something going on, and you can you can find out more about it on at the website seniorwednesday.org. That's where we all kind of have our access to our sites and, and the general information, not the specific program information, but you can get that at our website, so that'll link you there. Um, and I, I have to thank uh, for sponsorship for Senior Wednesday because it it's quite a lot of work to uh, line up speakers uh, for 10 consecutive months and uh, and put this on and we have the Charles and Joanne McElwain Foundation to thank for the uh, funding that allows us to do that this year and next year so we thank them they are also funding a uh, quarterly speaker series which will occur we, we haven't got it scheduled yet. It'll probably be a mixture of evenings and weekends at different times to attract larger audiences, very much like this series, uh, only quarterly. And so you'll, you'll hear more about that uh, very soon. Also, um, I want to extend Samantha, who you're accustomed to seeing, and she's uh, such a great uh, host. Uh, we. She couldn't be here today, so I, I am thrust into the spotlight. I'm Eric, the director, Eric Kale, so in case you don't know me. Um, I also want to thank the Friends of the Historical Museum volunteers, and uh, the Friends uh, put out the refreshments. We have uh, 20 volunteers every year who make sure that we have the best refreshments in town, which I think makes us one of the, the premier Senior Wednesday destinations. So we, we thank the volunteers. We have a lot of uh, friends, actually, and today we'll, be, uh, we'll fo focus on our docent friends, uh, our volunteer docents who, um, who they, uh, many are teachers or former teachers, and uh, they all have that love of history and a didactic street where they like to share a story and they're uh, they're they're great presenters and we thought we would cap off uh, this program uh, with a presentation from uh, four of them today and they'll introduce themselves as they come up and I hope you'll just say a little about yourself if you feel like it too um, but they're going to share with you uh, some of their favorite uh, subjects and, and places in the museum. And uh, then, afterwards, uh, there will be a tour through. So you're all welcome to, to join them for that. Um, I'm DJ Spaeth, and I'm one of the docents here. We have great docents here, and we're treated really well by, by the Historical Society. Um, we're all just going to give a teeny bit of our background. I am in my 53rd year of teaching. Um, average Kansas teacher, last five years. So I'm not from Kansas, but I'm a Kansan now. Um, I currently teach at Wichita State University, and I teach those people who want to learn how to. Do I need to be louder or what? Yeah, I'm going to just adjust this so, so you're a little closer. So. Okay. Is that much better? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. To me up here, it sounds like a megaphone, and I got a big voice and a big mouth anyway. Um, <clears throat> so um, I currently teach those people who want to become teachers and certify them for the state. So in this year, I just I have a spectacular group, so I'm really happy. I'm also a docent at the Wichita Art Museum, and I give tours at the Frank Lloyd Wright House. So I love history. I love all of these things. and. It was hard today to choose because we were supposed to choose some of our favorites, but we can't be in the room. So I thought, how's this going to work? But Zach took great pictures. So I'm going to start with this one. 
This is in the Victorian cottage. I don't know how familiar you are with Victorian morning hair art. It's a big form of art. Started by um, Queen Victoria in England when her husband, Albert Prince Consort Albert died, she had a necklace made that she wore of his hair. And it becomes a big tradition. And it travels to the United States as well. This thing is like, I gotta put it down. I just see the mic, I don't see any of you. Can you still hear me? Okay. Um, one thing about hair that you have to understand, it doesn't decay. So it becomes very sentimental. When we do um, the morning period up in the Victorian parlor, it changes by seasons and what goes on. And you should see the kids when I tell them that it was customary for people to be laid out at their, in their homes. It was before funeral parlors. And the last thing that was done before the day of the burial was to cut the hair from the person so that the women would make art out of this hair and you would keep the people together. And the kids just think that's the yuckiest thing. I mean, it, it's really fun to see them. Um, this tradition really increases in the United States. Guess what period it really increases in? Come on, guess, people. You're smart. Civil War. Exactly. I knew a docent would get it. And we're not taught this stuff. We each teach what we want to teach. So good job, docents. Um, Yes, it increased a lot before the soldiers went off to war because so many people didn't come back. And then their hair was preserved and art was made out of it. So this one is pretty typical of what was done in the United States. So there were stores that sold patterns for weaving. Can you imagine going to the store and buying a pattern to weave your dead relative's hair? But it, it was really very fashionable. So um, they also sold dried flowers, beads, um, wooden beads, other things that will embellish the picture. We have another one up in the cottage that afterwards, if you want to see, I'll point it out to you, that's much more intricate than this one. But what the people would do would take um, wire, thin wire, and they would weave that hair over thin wire and make it into patterns that were flowers. And it was really, really popular. Another popular way to use it was to make a Victorian wreath that was a horseshoe. And the horseshoe for Victorians was a sign of good luck, but also the horseshoe points up so it's descendant. You want your person that's deceased to go to heaven. And I read an interesting little article about, a, it was a letter in one of these books I was reading in the Smithsonian, and it said that there was a woman who, when her mother-in-law died, turned the horseshoe upside down. <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. Um, let me think what else I'm going to tell you about. Oh, a lot of these were made into necklaces that people wore, glass necklaces, almost like the mustard seed, only with the hair inside of it. But they also made hair bracelets. And it wasn't just for people that were dead. They made a lot of it. Um, usually when I have an elementary class, I'll ask a girl's name and a boy's name. And you know, at that time, they don't, fifth grade, they don't want anything to do with each other. And I'll say, OK, to the girl, if you like this boy and you want him to know it, you cut a lock of your hair and you have a friend take it to him. And they're all laughing by this point. And then to the boy, I say, if you're interested in this girl, you're going to put it in your watch or somewhere. You're going to keep it close to you or to your heart, and you're going to send a lock back. And it, these kids are hilarious. They go, oh, yuck, who would do that? Um, sometimes, uh, I didn't know this until I started really researching these hair pictures, but sometimes the hair was ground into a pigment, and it's used to paint the background of a morning scene in a portrait. I just thought that was interesting. You can go online, and the Smithsonian has several of these where they've you know, gone back and figured out what they're made out of. But it, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, let me think what else. Uh, there's so much I could tell about this that I just want to, because we're all doing several things. OK. Once funeral parlors come into being, the trend dies out. A lot of it is because they're, they're not, the body's no longer at home at the end. Um, it just falls out of fashion. But 
believe it or not, it's come back today. So currently there is, I have to read this because I didn't know about it. The Morbid Anatomy Museum offers classes in hair design and you can bring any hair of your own from your family or what's really popular now is a dead pet. Yeah, but then maybe six months ago I was reading this article and it was about 23 and Me. And in that article, it brought up the fact of how many people are bringing in their family hair pictures to have them see where they're descended from. And I guess there's been some shocks in some families. So kind of interesting. So be careful what you look for. OK. What I did, what I did was pick out things that the kids really like when they go through. There's so much up there. I mean, Jamie's done a wonderful job of getting all these artifacts that are just fascinating. But the kids are the one that seem the most fascinated by things there. A, a lot of people my age, bring, it brings back memories. But for the kids, this is all new. So of course, kids know letters to Santa. So I thought, they're not going to be interested in this. But they're so interested in it. First of all, the penmanship fascinates them. A lot of them, cursive is coming back, but a lot of them went through where they didn't learn cursive, and they go, how did they write like that? And upstairs, we have the inkwell, we have the pen, we have the blotter, and I explain it. And when they figure that out, their teacher always points out, see, it's not so bad writing in school today. But the way this starts is letters to Santa didn't begin it was the idea of Santa in different countries has different names, you all know that, but their traditions were different. So in Scotland, the children would yell up the chimney what they wanted for Christmas because everybody thought Santa came and went via the chimney, no matter what group it is. And so they would do that. Then it evolves over time in different countries. Kids write the letter to Santa and they lay it by the chimney. So Santa's going to get it when he comes up and down. So it becomes really popular then for, for kids to start writing letters to Santa. So how does it happen in the United States? There's a man that a lot of you will know if you know history, the greatest political cartoonist in my opinion, Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast is asked to write an article and do a um, caricature almost. And he is the first one that really for us makes what is the modern day Santa. And he makes him in a brown coat, and he looks like an elf. So this is the time period of the C Civil War, and Santa is for the Union, which is why he's in the brown coat. I, I didn't know that until I started teaching history. I just found that so interesting. Uh, later, he does Santa for over 30 years. And he is the one, a lot of people mistakenly think it's Coca-Cola that made the real Santa we see today. but. It actually comes from Thomas Nast doing the Santa and evolving him into the red coat and that. Then Coca-Cola hires another artist. I can't remember his name right now. But they hire him. He reads The Night Before Christmas. And that's where you come up with the twinkle and the change in the face. So it's really interesting how this comes about. Um, what happens is, Thomas Nass does a cartoon, and he shows um, somebody delivering a mail, a letter, in the post office box to Santa. That's what starts kids writing and mailing the letters. Creates a huge problem for the US Postal Service. All right, the dead letter office, they're inundated. So we go through several changes in America of what happens with these letters. And the Postmaster General allows an allowance one year so that these letters can be given to philanthropic organizations to help fulfill this. Then they decide some people that are wealthy are writing the letters and they don't need it. So the next Postmaster General doesn't have the allowance. It, this goes on and on. It's really a fascinating history to read about this. So um, what happens eventually is, listen to this date, 1989, Santa Claus gets a zip code. 1989. That's crazy, but there's a whole lot that goes on in between. And I tried to find out what happened in Wichita, but I couldn't really find enough detail of what happened. But each local community at first comes up with their own thing. But the idea of the North Pole comes from the cartoon that Thomas Nass drew, 
because that's the letter Santa Claus at the North Pole. I never knew where that came from. It's really interesting. So the great thing about these letters and the reason I use it with kids, there's a lot of history in this. This girl is writing, and I don't know if you can read it from where you're standing. You need some muscles. Uh, okay, it says, I hope the letter reaches you in fine health and good humor. I have a student read that line when I hold the letter up, and I go, what does it mean? They haven't got a clue. So we talk about how language changes over time, and then I get the kids to reword that. How would you say that? And it, it really makes an impact on them. But also, if you look at the, what does she want? I would like a baby doll with real hair. The kids go, oh, what? They're not used to that. So there's another use for hair, and we talk about that a little bit. Um, at the last one I did, this little boy looked at a girl and he goes, you'd be good for that doll. And I'm like, oh my goodness. All right, but then it goes on and it talks about how they look through the monkey ward catalog, the Montgomery ward. And she says, but Uncle Willie calls it monkey wards. That brought back memories to me of going through. These kids don't know what a Sears catalog is or what Montgomery wards is. But a lot of these letters bring back history as you read them. So um, I'm going to give you a book title. There are several books on these letters. But there is one by Alex Palmer. And it's called Letters to Santa. It's by Alex Palmer. And here's just a quote from one of the letters. A boy writes and asks, quote, can I trade my sister when she gets here for an elf? <laughs> and every page is like that. They're the, just the cutest letters that you have. So there's just a little background on Letters to Santa. But the kids love this letter when we go through it. Okay, what's next? The mustache cup. Okay, you can, maybe I'll just hold this thing. Okay, the mustache cup becomes very, very fashionable during the Victorian times, and it spreads wildly to America. And what's interesting, you know, I haven't looked at the bottom. One. Jamie, do you know if this one's from England? I don't know either. I'm going to turn it up and look. But it's more desirable to have one from England than one that gets made here. So they're unique, and <clears throat> mustaches become really popular during the Victorian times. And because I'm a history teacher, I know why. Anybody know why? It's crazy in America, but it's because of the British in India. They distinguished themselves, and they had a lot of free time. So they worked up, I mean, you can look up pictures. There's ones where people take their mustache and divide it into six parts, but it made them very distinctive as individual men that were wearing uniforms. They couldn't, they had to have their hair short, and they had to have no facial hair down here. So the mustache becomes really popular. These photographs become distributed, and people in the United States, there's a mustache right there. But yours is very conservative from, from this time period. OK. So the, the men would often dye them. They would wax them. And have you ever heard the expression, uh, getting into hot water? It comes from this time. Because they waxed them, they dyed them. The steam came up, and the wax would drip down their face, would drip on their clothes. It was a mess. So. There's a man named, what is his name? I can't remember his name. It'll come to me. All right, anyway, there's a man that develops a patent and makes this cup with that mustache guard in there. Kind of looks like a butterfly. This was so popular, he could retire in 15 years from his profits. That's, that's incredible to read about. So men were happy because now they're protected. They can drink. And it doesn't bother their mustache at all. So now they're proper in society. Because remember, during that time, they're wearing these white starched things that are, we don't have automatic laundries and don't, no dry cleaners. I mean, it's really different. So Harvey Adams is the man's name. I knew it would come to me. In other words, he creates a sippy cup for men. <laughs> that's what, that's what the, one kid, that's not my original idea. A kid on a tour goes, so it's a sippy cup for a man. And I go, yep, you're right. And then another kid at that time said, well, my grandma has hair on her face. And I'm like, I mean, what do you say to a kid like that? You just move on. 
Okay, so this is popular. It's in the Sears catalog. It's in Montgomery Wards. It's sold by uh, Marshall Fields, and then later it's sold by Macy's. So you might the larger size for Kansans is called a farmer's cup. They always come with saucers. So uh, it was so funny because I'm reading this, you know, antidote about it, and there's this ad in a paper that says, if the lady who stole the gent mustache cup on Saturday night from the Little Dustpan restaurant will apply it once, she can have the saucer free. <laughs> so you might think this is a thing of the past. Right now, you can go to the Dead Rabbit Bar in New York. You can order a punch from the 1870s. It's served in a mustache cup, and the point is to keep the ice from coming through. So they found a new modern use for the mustache cup. Don? You have one? Well, you have a mustache, oh, two mustaches in a row. Yeah, do you use it or are you just. But you don't wax. <laughs> okay. So what, this is my last one. This is really the most interesting. When, when I ask kids, what do you want to talk about? I let them pick the objects because there must be 30,000 objects in that room. They always pick this first. First of all, I say, what do you think it is? And they have the best, uh, best ideas. Uh, always what comes up is it's a, it's a tool for a parent to punish a kid. Always. <laughs> Some people think it's a necklace, that it's a decorative necklace of the time. Um, I've had kids guess it, it, everything, a microscope, uh, and I have them, you know, I, I'm holding it with gloves, and I have them look through, and they go, no, you couldn't see anything. So what it is, is it's an early portable hearing aid. So, oh, kids guess it's a vacuum cleaner, too. I think as when you see it upstairs and you look at it, it's kind of like the cloth that was around the, the hoses on a vacuum cleaner. So the first hearing aids were horns, just carved out horns that people put in their ear. And then they go to the ear trumpet. You, you all know the big ear trumpet. Think of the Victoria, um, Victrola and the big horn there. All right, but that made it difficult because if you go to another room, how does the individual hear? This is a time with large homes and a lot of times grandma or grandpa lived with the family. So that becomes a problem. So then they come up with what's called the speaking tube. This is known, the picture I found of this said speaking tube or conversation tube. But what was great about this, the advantage was they could move room to room. The disadvantage, only one person can talk at a time. The very first tour I gave here, I held it up and I was explaining it and a kid yelled in it. It works. I thought, I'm not going to hear for one week. So um, eventually this one changes, they add a carbon transmitter to it, and then that got too complicated for me, so I just quit on that. So I just talk about this. So those are my four favorite things in the Victorian cottage. I got all Eric stuff up here. There you go. Okay. And also, I always uh, throw in a little science lesson when we do this because air, or I mean sound waves, travel through solids much better than it does through air, through gas. And so that's why it's going to help you to hear better, because the air is traveling through the solid, um, the solid hose, yeah, and then magnified. And then we do a little, tell them to go home and do a little, and you guys can do this too, a little experiment when you go home, take a spoon, tie um, string or tie the spoon on a string just string and put your fingers wrap the string around your your fingers and put it in your ears and then bang the spoon up against something and it sounds like a bell because it's traveling through the sound is traveling through the string through a solid I used to be a third grade teacher <laughs> That's why, I, that's why I know this stuff. Uh, my name is Kathy McElroy. I am a retired teacher. I taught for 31 years, not quite as long as a DJ, in uh, Mulvane. I taught everything. I mean, I taught 
mostly primary, but I ended my career as a gifted facilitator in the, in the district. I love history. When I retired, everybody said, don't do anything for the first year because it, you're just going to get yourself too busy. But the thing I did during the first year was say, I want to be a docent at the Historical Museum. So I've been here since the fall of 2017. Um, and I love this, this guy, too. I'm going to talk a little bit more about, DJ talked about the things that are inside the cottage. I'm going to talk about the things that we call kind of outside the cottage. So I'm going to be talking about the bathrooms and the kitchens, okay? So when I take little kids into, well, or anybody really, but when little kids come and see this bathroom, there are several things that I point out to them. One of them is, well, and what they're all really interested in is the bathtub which is claw-footed, of course. It's made of metal, and it has the, the oak railing around it. The toilet, if you look at, oh, and sorry, this, this house has hot and cold running water. And so that's a phrase, you know, that you and I probably know. Oh, it has hot and cold running water. Well, <laughs> for uh, children in 2023, that's kind of like, yeah, uh, duh, okay. Whatever. So we talk about this room, the bathtub. They usually notice the claw foot, the claw feet on there. We talk about, you can't really see it in this picture necessarily, but you'll see it when you go up there. The toilet looks like our toilet. They recognize that. They know what that is. Um, but then the way that the toilet flushes is uh, the water uh, closet up there or the the box, whatever. <laughs> and so I have had kids say, yeah, okay, so how do you flush it? All right, well, you pull the chain. <laughs> Some of you guys probably know about this, but then I also get, now really, I am not a scientist necessarily, but we have another science lesson in here, because why did they put the, um, the water way up high there? Gravity, that's right. The gravity, right, so it's going to come down faster, and the pressure, the two, uh, the two um, pipes that go up there, one is uh, larger than the other one, and so we have a good talk about that. We also talk about the, believe it or not, the toilet paper holder, because the guy who patented the toilet paper holder, mostly men, are you paying attention? He says that there is a certain way for the toilet paper to go on the holder. And it is over the top, just so you know. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. That's true. So that's one of the fun things we talk about. We also talk about that um, the, t um, the toilet, this is one of the fun things, it, that the toilet is not flushed every time. So we have a little saying that if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. That's a, fra that's a phrase that my mom also knew about because her sister had a sailboat, and that's the rule on the sailboat. When I visited my nephew's house in the Bahamas, they had a sister, and that's also the rule there. And according to one of the students in one of our tours, that's also the rule in the jail. Okay. So I said, well, look at that. <laughs> How amazing is that? That's wonderful. OK. Um, also, another thing that we talk about on this a lot of times is that there is no shower here. Uh, and so for a lot of you, probably, I didn't have a shower in my bathroom until I was a teenager. You know, and uh, <laughs> when I moved out of my little tiny house in Udall, Kansas, and moved to Texas, I didn't, we didn't have showers in the bathroom. Also, if you, when you go up there, if you look at the, the sink, it has a lot of, it has um, the shaving mug. It has a lot of powders and soaps. It has a straight razor. And there on the side, you can see it has the uh, sharpener, the leather, the razor strap. Um, what you will not see there is a toothbrush because a toothbrush as we know it did not become uh, widely used in the United States till after World War I. And when um, our guys went over to Europe and they said, and came back and said, dude, 
they got this thing over there that really makes it easy to keep your teeth clean. So that's when we, my grandma, who was born in 1895, um, always said she was going to clean her teeth. She never said she was going to brush her teeth. She was going to clean her teeth. And I even remember as a little girl, she had some tooth powder, you know, that she would kind of clean her teeth with. Or use baking soda and salt. That's exactly right. Yep. This is the inside of the bathroom talking about, you know, that it is that it is metal. The bathroom, the bathtubs did become uh, porcelain not too long after this. Um, they were porcelain in England, but they're so heavy that they didn't export them from England. And then it took a while for the factories here in the United States to um, manufacture them. All right. Sorry, I didn't really go through all of these pictures. So you guys can see uh, there on the sink. No toothbrush. And sometimes we talk about the <laughs> sharpening the razor. You know, that's the razor strop that occasionally in the, in the um, classic literature, we have children getting beat with a razor strop, and that's it. And that causes some big old round eyeballs when we look at that. This is the kitchen. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at this, you know, I just, the kids say, oh, yeah, it's a kitchen. Well, okay, so how do you know? How do you know it's a kitchen? Well, of course, because it has a stove and it has a sink. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah. Okay, hang on. All right. So we talk about this kitchen. The stove here is, the, is a coal stove, not a wood stove. Um, so we talk about how the heck do you know when it's hot enough to bake cookies or bread or whatever. And so there's several different ways uh, that you can tell, of course, and probably a lot of you guys know that, know something. You know, you can put your hand in the oven and count to five or whatever, and if it's hot enough, you take it out, then you know it's probably hot enough to make cookies. DJ's grandma had a piece of um, paper that she would put on the on the stove, you know, when it, it the like a wrap uh, like a grocery bag paper, and when it kind of starts turning colors, you know. How many of you have read the book Fahrenheit 451 or know about it? So where did the name of that come from? Paper burns at 451 degrees. We have a literature lesson and a science lesson when we go through here. Um, okay, and the one thing that I that I love, it's so fun. I didn't tell, I didn't have Samantha um, highlight this, but you see the thing against the wall that looks kind of like a flower. Can you see it back there? Okay, so I asked the, I take it and I ask the students what they think that is. And they think it's a fly swatter <laughs> at first until I'm like, yeah, I wonder how many flies I would kill with this. <laughs> and then we talk about the, that it's the a rug beater or a mattress, a, you know, those kind of things. That's what it's for. This is, uh, I have had only like three people, kids and adults, um, that know what this appliance on the right is. There's probably a lot of you who know what it is. And so most of the time when I ask the students, what is this? They all say cheese grater. That's right. They all say cheese grater. And I say, I love it. No, it's not. So what is it? Yeah, it's a toaster. Okay, and so you pull, we can see it when we go upstairs, you pull the wire, you can see it's pulled away from it. You pull the wire down, you put the piece of bread there, you put the wire back, and then you put it on the stove, and it toasts the bread, and then you, and then you can turn it over to, um, you know, to toast the other side of it. The people that have known what this is, one person, they use it when they, they have something like this when they go camping. And uh, another lady, her grandma had this, and so her grandma made toast for her with something like this. The thing on the, the left, I mean, yeah, that's right, your left, <laughs> is a hot water heater. 
uh, you can see it has a gauge on the top of it. It's, um, you can't see it as well in this picture, but you can see when you get up there, it's powered by um, like uh, oil down here. And then you can see the, the black thing that's on the right there is the coil, are the coils. So this house had uh, a hot water heater there. And um, it was pretty cool. The, and the hot water heaters like this came into being around in the late um, 19th century, early 20th century. If you look on the table there, that little contraption that is in the lower left part that looks like a, ma a machine with the little white thing there, anybody know what that apparatus is? You hold it on, the, on that little thing that's sticking up that's kind of round and you push it. Yes, it is, it's a cherry pitter. And so someday when you come to the museum and you don't see this cherry pitter, I live at 1130 South Sagebrush, and I have a cherry tree in my yard. <laughs> so occasionally I say I'm going to steal that. But anyway, but that's a cherry pitter. And this, all the kids know what this is. It's a vacuum. That's exactly right. It's a vacuum. And I think they know what this is by looking at it because of the bottom, because of the, the head of it there. The way this vacuum works is you can see um, on the right here, the um, handles are pulled apart, and then on the left, they're there. And so I'm so happy to tell you we have another science lesson here about nature abhorring a vacuum and how what happens when you create the vacuum, okay, that sucks the stuff up in there. And then we sometimes have a little conversation about, you know why we call a vacuum a vacuum, people? I mean, you know, you call it a vacuum, but that's, yeah, that's why. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so we have Maureen there. Um, the kids really like this. Uh, there's one more thing that I forgot to tell that I didn't think about telling Samantha. When we go up there, uh, you guys will see it. It's what's on where we call the back porch. And in the back porch, we have an ice box, those things. But we also have something that it looks like, <laughs> and most of the students say, it's a potty. They think it's a potty back there because it's like a square box, and it has a hole in the middle of it, and then there it has a lid up on it. But it is really, well, I don't know if I should tell you what it is or whether I should make go up there and stand and make you guess. Hmm. Maybe I'll tell you. It is a, it's kind of like a crock pot. If you'll notice when you get up there, it has a big uh, a round kind of stone that's kind of laying on the top of it. And so what the people did was, you know, I don't know if any of you know Kansas summers, but <laughs> when if you got a, a, a stove going in your house 24-7, it's going to get really hot, okay? So a lot of times they would, in, in that, time when it was so hot, they would make the dinner in the morning, and then they would put it in that crock pot, in that thing, and keep it down in there, and then they would have the, the stone heated, and put the stone on the top, and then close it, and so it would still be, uh, it would still be warm when it was time for dinner, and they didn't have to have the, the stove going. We also talk about why the kitchen is in the back of the house, usually, is because it to keep the heat away, but also that's where a fire is going to start if it's going to, and so it's back in the... Okay, there you are. Okay, so I'm Maureen Kirby. I haven't been a docent as long, but <laughs> you have to start somewhere. I used to work at the Historical Museum when it was on East Douglas, and I fell in love with the museum there. And uh, since then, I've raised a family of things. My kids are out of college. They've all graduated, so I, I'm back. <laughs> they can't get rid of me. So I, the Magic City is a fantastic exhibit. They have so, so much history involved, and I couldn't pick out what I really wanted to focus on. So I've opted to do the Grasshopper exhibit. And the reason why is because I didn't know there was a devastation by grasshoppers here in this whole area in Kansas. And they were only an inch long, inch and a half long. And they came, you know, they had two years of um, bad crops, so they had a drought. They see a black cloud coming and think, wow, okay, rain, finally, relief. 
Except when it got a little closer, they realized, oops, it's not, excuse me, can you hear me better? <laughs> they, they realized, oh, this is not good. These, these are insects. And I couldn't believe they would eat everything they could get a hold of. They'd eat the clothes off the line. They'd get, eat the screens off the windows. If they got in the houses, they'd eat the quilts right off the beds. Um, the, the cattle or the, the livestock, if the livestock ate, it would kill them, the crop. The, uh, and um, another thing, if they survived and they ate the, the, you know, the livestock that had survived, they tasted like the insects. The insects um, were so, uh, there were like millions of them. Uh, the trains couldn't go because they couldn't get traction because they were so all over the tracks. Um, they ate the fleece right off the sheep. One little boy said, well, did they eat people? I said, no, they didn't eat people. <laughs> so, but they did. They completely devastated everyone. And do what? Fence yes, they even ate fence posts. There was one article that I read, and it said, you know, it got a hold of the handle on the rake. And it, they had to resand the rake so that they could use it again. Uh, one lady was talking um, she had a spoon. Was, I'm taking classes right now. And she held up a wooden spoon. And she says, by itself, it doesn't look important. But when you know the provenance and the story behind it, there's a lot of importance to it. The reason it was important was because when the, the grasshoppers came through and destroyed everything, even the quilts off her bed, she was in tears, the wife. So there was some wood left on a watering trough. And he made the spoon out of that wood that was left and gave it to his wife. Um, the, the, you know, so this is a really negative, sad, heartbreaking, I was it's just amazed that this happened. Um, one farmer described it as, if you go outside at noon and you'd look up, you could see them flying overhead. And the ones that dropped down to the ground looked like snowflakes. So it was interesting to, to, to read the different stories that I did read. Um, I think these are basically different um, aspects of it. And then because of that, they, they uh, ended up deciding, OK, we need to come up with a crop that isn't prone to drought and the insects. So they came with wheat. And it's the turkey red wheat that came to Kansas. Um, so that's kind of a different story. But out of the sadness of the devastation, obviously, they had no crops. So they had no money. And you know a lot of farmers were going to leave. And so people stepped forward to help them. And the news got all through the country. People from as far as Ohio sent help and aid. And um, they have, like, upstairs, they have, I, uh, I think it's a, a greeting card. Or, I, I mean, a, I can't think of what it's called. You know, the cards when they visit. And it has grasshoppers on it. So they were trying to turn this negative into a positive by using grasshoppers. Well, it's 10 years later, after 1874, um, in 1884, Ohio was devastated by a flood. And so Sedgwick County had a train, and there's an exhibit up there, and it has a picture of a train, and it has the grasshoppers on the side. And it's basically our way of saying thank you. So the negative and the positive are both there. The negative, devastation, positive, people step forward to help people, and that's as it should be. My name is Barbara Broughton. I am also a retired teacher. I taught for 38 years. I started out in Andover teaching fourth grade. Then I got a library certificate and was a librarian in Wichita for a number of years. But I spent the last 20 years at Wilbur Middle School teaching gifted kids in middle school. And that was my, that probably, that, well, they were all good jobs, but that was my favorite of, of everything. I just, lo I love kids that age. And I, uh, and I know that not everybody does, but I'm glad that some of us do, because otherwise they wouldn't make it. Um, I've, been, I've been working here uh, as a docent at, at the museum for about 13 years, ever since I retired. And I also was involved, very involved with National History Day at that time, and, and have been off and on since then, too. So there's a, and I've, so I've always loved history. In my family, some of my children, two, I have three children, two of them really like history. One of them is beginning to love it more, and it, it's kind of, except for my husband was not a historian, and we would go to museums, and whenever we were working on things, I would tell my kids when they were doing projects and things, 
make if, if you can get someone to stop and look at it for a few minutes that could care less that's what you're looking for so that's what we would work on a lot so that's i picked i picked the child's world which is if you had lived a hundred years ago or so and we don't look so much for differences as we look for how you how things are the same and at first they don't think they're the same at all you'll know uh this, uh, this is a picture, of course, it's a depiction of a classroom. And I ask the kids, what is this? They all know it's a classroom. And I say, why? Well, there's desks. I say, are those the kinds of desks that you had? Nobody has desks like that. Now, I remind them that I'm not 100 years old. However, in my first and second grade classroom did have desks like these. And we couldn't move them because they're not, they're not uh, they're not cemented to the floor uh, so, that the, so that we don't take them out of the museum. They were just like that. They were bolted to the floor so they couldn't be moved. Um, the seat, for one, is the, the seat is the, from, from, the front, from one desk to the other. They, they, they fit together. So there's always going to be a seat left in the front, which we talk about why was there a seat there. Well, some of them get the idea, oh, a visitor, or the teacher could help. Get around to it pretty soon. Somebody says that's probably where the kid was, or the teacher had to watch closer. <laughs> and then, and then they they all look at the kid in the room that probably would have been most likely to have been there, <laughs> which is very funny. <laughs> um, and also, we talk about how you had to put your desk up. You had to be when you left. And I say, well, why do you have to do that? Well, and they they figure. Is there? There we go. Um, they they figure it out pretty fast that uh, that is so that when the, when the room is being cleaned, it can be cleaned easier. But then back, not a hundred. Well, anywhere from any depending on where your school was, in some small schools, who was cleaning the room? I'll ask the kids, and they of course they have janitors and I, all this. And I said, well, not then. The teacher had to do it, so it was really important that you put your desk up. There's a, li there's a picture over on the side on your left that it, it goes all the way up to, the, up to the ceiling. And it's very interesting to look at if you go into, if you go into the exhibit. There's a picture of a classroom. It shows all a, a classroom in Wichita around, I think it's around 1908. There are multiple grades in the classroom. The kids pick up that right away. There's also a teacher standing at the back who looks very, very stern. And the kids don't look exactly thrilled to be doing what they're doing either. Of course, having pictures taken was a big deal. We talk about that. We talk about that they had had their picture taken probably three or four times that day because usually the teachers are, and the parents are snapping pictures all over the place on their phones. But this was a serious occasion to have your picture taken. So we, we get into that, and then, do you have kindergartners in your room? Oh, you're second graders, you're no kindergartners. And then we talk about different ages being there and how that was different. But at the, and then the other thing is about the teacher. And they, they said, does, I think, do, you, do you think the teacher's mean? And they will go, yeah, kind of, but not really. And so I, I make up stories to, about these people. I don't know them at all, who knows? But I think she's just tired. She has to do all of these lesson plans for all these kids, and then she has to clean the, clean the room after school. So she's just tired. Um, they notice that, of course, there's a chalkboard. There's a map. We talk about, would you use this map today if, if, to be accurate? And most of them know there, there, were no, there, there weren't as many states, depending on the grade. This is kind of set up for tours for, for kids in the primary grades, although it works for any, any age. And, and, yes, there's five. That's right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because quite often the music teacher was also the same person who was teaching class. Yes. So very good. Thank you for bringing that up. I always forget that. And so, and then of course they're writing in cursive on the board, and 
they will always notice. I said, what do you, what, what's in this room that you have in your room? And they, they, they will say desks. They will say laps. They, they will say that the chalkboard, and I say, you guys have chalkboards? No, we have whiteboards. So how do you know? They, they realize right away they can tell that that's the same thing as. Uh, they also have clocks, although their clock does not usually look at all like the ones that we have in our, in our classroom here. And we point out that this, I always point out that this is a school clock. Well, we go roundabout to get to a school clock, but, and that's what they were called because of the shape and everything. And people still decorate their homes with those. So I tell them that if you go into somebody's house and you say, oh, you have a school clock, they'll think you're really smart or they're gonna wonder, how do you know that? <laughs> you know, one or the other. And then they usually notice that there's an American flag, so we talk about that all classrooms always have an American flag. And other things come up, of course, through the, through the course of this. But, but going to school is something that they had in common with children 100 years ago. Just like, and, and much, much before that, too, but especially where this is the time period we're looking at. It depends on the school. Most of the time they do, because I think in most of the school, most of the schools here, they still, we are still saluting the flag we went at the beginning of the day. Yeah, yeah, that is true. They don't have to stand up, and so that. And I haven't been in any classrooms where that it li like that. But uh, I'm sure the farther up we're going, it's, it's going to become more and more prevalent. The, um, the there are many many exhibits in this one larger exhibit, and we don't have time to look at all of them. So I'm going to just pick out a few of them. But this this is the first one when you come in. If you come in the door. The, the, it depends which door you come in, but this is the first one that we start with when we're doing a tour. Whoops. No, that is the next thing. We talk a lot about the toys of the time. And these would have been toys um, that, you know, I, I ask them, what's there? They know almost every single one of those toys, even though some of them don't look too much like theirs. Most of them look enough like the ones we play with today that they know. Of course, the car, um, the scooter. Scooters are not that different. Um, it, we don't. We can't see up the wall there, but there's some skates, and the the skates that they, this roller skates that they had, are closer to our inline skates, except that they fit on your bottom of your shoe. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then there's a bicycle there, which is totally not safe. We talk about how do you stop it. There's no brakes. You just slow down and jump off and no helmets. How did we survive? Um, and then inside the, the glass, there's, there's different kinds of, all different kinds of games. The ball, the great big black, black brownish thing is a homemade baseball, more like a huge softball today. Uh, there are marbles. The kids love marbles. And when we have tours sometimes, we'll have grandparents who are on the tour, or even other, even, even other, pa uh, other parents who are on the tour who, who remember playing with, with, uh, with marbles. Some of them may even have their, still have their marbles. My son-in-law, who spent a lot of time in Germany when he was growing up, they still, they, that's what they used to do at recess. On the on the air, on the army base where he went to school, they'd have, and he, he won't let his boys yet have his have his marbles, and they are all over. They are all between the ages of 18 and 25, and they still can't have his marbles. So I don't know that they're ever going to get them. But one of the things we do, and sometimes when when we have tours, and then other times when we're doing something special in the museum, they'll open up the room across from this exhibit and have those games out for the kids to play. And then it's always fun for me to have somebody that knows how to actually shoot marbles. I know how to do it, I just can't do it. It never goes where it's supposed to. And so, <laughs> so we just you know, do this way, this way, but it's always fun to have somebody along that knows how to do it. 
Um, and then we also they also play with some other toys from 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 the past, and they love it. They don't miss the electronics at all. And some part way through this, we'll talk about. Um, do you think the kids the kids were uh, that lived back a hundred years ago? Do you think they were deprived? Oh yes, yes, yes. They were so deprived. Do you think they were sad? Yes, yes, yes. I said, I said. So you think they were boring? They kind of look around. I said, are you boring? No. I said, so, so, so do you think they were? And then they start to get the idea that they had what they, that they, they used what they had. You can't miss something you don't know you never had. So you can't miss TV if you didn't have TV. Uh, looking back now, we didn't get TV when I was a little girl till I was about five or six. My grandparents had it a little bit sooner. But after we got TV, I don't know how we lived without TV, but before that, we didn't know the difference. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it, it kind of helps help us to get, get the kids to have a perspective about that. Um, but anyway, they love this, uh, this looking at this exhibit. Here's another one. Now this one <laughs> is a whole room. This is just a part of it, filled with dolls. The dolls belong to Mrs. Beachy whose home eventually became the second, the second location for the Historical Museum on, on East Douglas. Uh, many people today know it as Kirstie Alley's house. But, uh, but she, she gave her doll collection to be displayed in the, in the museum as long as it could be displayed. It's been there for a long, long time, and she collected these dolls over a long, long time. The first thing the kids do usually when they walk in, especially the boys, they'll go, ah! and they'll run out. I go, no, we have to go in. We're going to look for the one that's the prettiest, the one that's the oldest, and the ones that's the scariest. Now, there are, there are uh, uh, on the wall, there are, there's a little picture, picture of each exhibit of each, and you, and you match up the doll and it has the year, so you could find the oldest one. They usually, they, they guess it first by looking at them. You can't tell by looking at them. And the oldest one is not in this picture either. And then they pick, all, they have all over the place where they pick their prettiest one. Some of them say none of them are, but that's fine. You don't have to like them. And then, and then, they, then, they, then they pick their scariest one, which also can be a little bit over. But most often, the little boy doll in the left up there wins. Because, um, I don't know, I don't want to wake up <laughs> in the morning and see that looking at me either, so. But, but it's an inch, and then we talk about collections and the, the fact that this collection was preserved. So there are people, you know, that, well, why do you collect? Why do you collect? So this is, a, this is kind of the excuse, well, it could end up in a museum someday. You never know, right? Um, then, there, then we talk about different ways that they played, not so different as we played. Um, there are throughout the throughout this exhibit. There's also poems that describe what the how the exhibit is. This one is by Robert Louis Stevenson. It talks about sailing. Now here we are in the middle of Kansas, <clears throat> and we're on the, and there are all kinds of toys and things that the kids played with that had to do with sailing and oceans, because we don't have them probably, but they but they pretended they and they of course this is on the stairs. And we then, what do you do today? And they go, we don't do anything like that. And I says, I bet you do. What if it was snowing and um, you were staying home from school and, oh, we built a fort. That's what this is. It's a fort. Just a little bit different. Um, and then there are all kinds of toys that depict what, the, what, what were actually in use at that time. The dishes, they're real glass dishes. We talk about that. Um, on the bottom... There are irons. I ask them what those are. Most of them have no clue. A few of the kids think that they're door stops because that's what some of the old irons are used for today. There are some that do know that it's really an iron. They, they love to, there's also a, uh, it doesn't show up real good, but there's a, a waffle iron. But we talk about you can't plug it in. So they did it on the stove. We have to talk about how to get the stove, and that, that was a lot harder, but they did it. And, and, of course, all the things are a little miniature. And this relates to the, especially the kids today because there's lots and lots of miniatures. <clears throat> kids are playing with miniatures everything. 
when the, when the, my, my granddaughter, who is dying, every time we go in there, which we were here last week, she goes, oh, there's the cute little things. They're so cute. Well, every time I have a third grade or a fourth grade or a second grade class, they all run in there, oh, these are so cute. <laughs> so you automatically know what age they are. But, but again, it's, you know, what old is new again. Up in the corner, way up high, can you see what the animal is up there? It's a, yes, it's a monkey. Now, and then we talk about this is on a ship. Monkeys were good luck on ships. And if you look at the old, you know, the old movies about ships, they always, they have monkeys going to flop it around all over on their sh shoulders. So they were very, very careful about making it very accurate. Then this is the other play area that we show. And is this one inside or outside? Uh, would your mother let you bring mud in the house to build a, a, a big, probably not. So we think it probably was made outside, a way to play outside. And again, it's, this one is, the, we, we talk about how you get a theme. The theme is transportation. And they recognize almost all these kinds of transportation because they are different but not from what we have today. And again, look, they put, a, they put an ocean down there with ocean liners on it. And they have, and, and of course, we don't, uh, they, can, they can immediately relate to Hot Wheels. These are not Hot Wheels, but they are, they're the forerunner of Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars. And uh, they see the blimp flying, and they go, we talk a little bit about that was, uh, that was something that people thought we would be traveling in, but where do we see them today? And they, they almost always know football games. <laughs> and, and, so, and then there are toys that they can still buy in this exhibit. Does anybody see something that you could buy that's exactly the same? The Tinker Toys. You can still get Tinker Toys that are wooden exactly like that. And, the, and of course, the Army people, too, you can get those. And we talk, again, and I always point out that if you're going to make an exhibit, Make sure that if you're going to put, if you want to make it fit a time period, make sure your army guys are the right army guys. And they, and, and, and they talk about, oh, and why do we know who that is? Some of, the boys, some of the kids do because they've studied that. And they'll say that, you know, <clears throat> those are World War I soldiers because of their hats and so forth. But other kids don't know that yet, but they do about by the time they leave. So again, this is a way that they played and we play yet today. Of course, we also talk about what's missing, what, what material is missing in all their toys. Plastic. Uh, we call this child's world, but it's almost like before plastic <laughs> because nothing in here is plastic. You will find also a, uh, a, uh, a carousel horse. Uh, if you ever go to Abilene, Kansas, the, the, the place that, the, where, they, where he built the Ab many, many of those horses, there's still a full... A carousel horse, a carousel up there with all the original horses that you can even ride, and the, and then of course the kids relate to that now because we have re, we have moved the one from that used to be at Joyland that many of us remember is now at Botanica, so they they could so again they relate to things that they didn't even realize that they are relating to. So I hope that you'll take a few minutes to go through and look at this. If you don't do it today, please come back and do it another time. And uh, thank you all for listening so carefully to us. Thank you. Thank you.